let's get started. Uh, welcome very much to our webinar today. It's the third edition of our um, series, and we will um, today we will focus on the topic of offsets. We have Jutta has also conducted the first webinar um, from us in this series, series, and she has given us an overview of um, yeah of biodiversity, the topic and the importance of biodiversity in general, and she has touched upon this instrument of offsetting, and we will today look more deep, deeply into it and also look. Um, at why it is so, uh, where it is used and why it is so problematic and what, um, yeah, um, how we can deal with it. And, um, and yeah, get to get more knowledge about it and to understand the system behind it as well. And um, yeah, so Jutta, I think not everybody knows you yet. So mm -hmm. maybe we have been working together since many years. You've been working with the Heinrich Böll Foundation for since many, many years. And, but please could you introduce yourself uh, to the others and then start with your input. Thanks a lot. And the, in general, the session is meant we have a half an hour input and then we really would welcome your questions to really use this session as a learning session to integrate these issues, be able to integrate these issues more into our work. That's the idea of it, that we can somehow integrate it more into our work as well and to yeah make it uh, yeah, useful for your work. Thank you, Johanna, for the introduction and for uh, to the Bell Foundation for organizing this. Well, I also think it's a very interesting webinar series. Uh, my name is Jutta Kiel. I uh, wear two hats. Uh, today I'm here as a consultant, but I'm a biologist and have followed uh, biodiversity, uh, carbon uh, certification schemes for the last 20 years, more or less. Uh, starting with a look at forest and forest destruction for paper use in Europe and gradually focusing more on uh, those market-based trading instrument in the context of uh, addressing the climate crisis or pretending at least to address the climate crisis. Um, and uh, today the focus will be on biodiversity offsetting. Um, so I will try to keep my input to 20 minutes and Christine or Johanna, maybe you can let me know when we're at uh, the half of the hour, because uh, I have to, to leave uh, uh, at the hour today. Uh, so um, I would like to start uh, the session today with a quick look back at um, the where well, we started off this uh, this webinar series, um, and well, there's somebody there, and um, looking at the level of biodiversity destruction today, which really is hard to grasp uh, when we look at the numbers. And I think as a society, we're still very far from really processing uh, the the danger also to our well being. Um, that this loss of biological diversity brings with it. Uh, 680 vertebrate species, almost 600 plant species that have been documented to have gone extinct uh, since the late 16th century. And that's only looking at the species diversity loss, uh, not even considering the loss of genetic diversity within uh, species. The rate of species extinction is also between 10 and 1,000 times um, higher than the normal background extinction rate, which is quite a bit. And it is also the first mass extinction in the Earth's history, as far as we can say, that is primarily driven by, um, often it's set by human activity. I've inserted industrial activity, human industrial activity, because I think it's not all humans equally uh, driving this extinction. And the drivers um, through uh, habitat destruction, fragmentation and the degradation of uh, habitat at a very massive scale. When, oh, what's happening? Um, oops, there, yes. When we look at the figures, um, roughly 50,000 years ago, humans uh, made up around 1% of the biomass and non-human life made up 99% of the biomass. And the comparison isn't quite um, 
accurate, I would say. But when you look at the picture today, you see that uh, humans and particularly the livestock and the plant life that's used to feed the livestock for human consumption, uh, they make up the vast majority and wild mammals, for example, only make um, up 4.2% uh, of the biomass. Uh, most of that change from a much more diverse um, and much more resilient uh, starting point to today has happened in the last uh, 200 years. Responses, what have they been? Uh, many decades of conservation initiatives, uh, conferences, be it in the context of the UN conventions um, or uh, conventions on protecting oceans and uh, more corporate and government commitments uh, to implement measures to hold biodiversity loss than we can count. Uh, the trouble is, uh, I did miss the point uh, because biodiversity destruction is still accelerating. So something's gone wrong. And today we will look at another, and I'll come back at the very end to why, you know, this isn't really a surprise to us. Uh, and But before that, let's look at another approach where we already know from the outset it's going to go wrong. And that is offsetting uh, a false solution. Um, but it's worse than a false solution, I would say. It's a, it's an approach that fast tracks biodiversity destruction, even though it's sold to us as uh, slowing down the destruction. Uh, why is that? Uh, I will first uh, take you uh, to three places very quickly uh, where biodiversity offset initiatives are already being implemented. And then in the second session um, or second part of the, my input, look at some lessons from the carbon offset experience uh, that kind of confirm what we're also already starting to see with the biodiversity offsets. And at the end, I'll say a word or two about credits versus offsets and whether there really is a versus. Um, so the first place to take you to is uh, in the uh, southeast of Madagascar, where the mining company Rio Tinto, one of the largest mining companies uh, in the world, is um, extracting ilmenite or titanium uh, dioxide, uh, a mineral that you will find in white industrial paint um, and white industrial plastics. Um, or plastics. Um, and uh, the trouble is uh, the mineral is found in the sand underneath uh, one of the last intact um, areas of about 1,500 hectares of very uh, high species endemism or forest with high species endemism. So species that are only found there. Um, but for Rio Tinto to dis extract the mineral, the forest had to go. Initially, there was quite strong uh, opposition to the mining project, including from large conservation organizations. Uh, IOCN um, did a lot of uh, campaigning against the mining operation. The Rio Tinto response to that was, okay, okay, um, here's a deal for you. Uh, if you uh, agree to the mining, we will campaign with you for uh, the uh, setting up of a new protected area, um, a national park. Um, and that can be the place to offset the biodiversity loss uh, for destroying uh, this uh, 1,500 hectares. The forest, and that's what they did. Um, so the opposition uh, dropped considerably from the conservation um, organizations and the project went ahead. Uh, the place where the biodiversity offset was put in place affected the land use or the, the food production area of uh, villages like Ansutsu, about 50 kilometers away from the mining site. Families where you see the houses there, when I stayed in the place, people took no more than 20 minutes to empty their house and nothing left in the house for us to be able to stay in the house where we were in the village. Uh, so you get an idea of um, you know, the, um, the amount of stuff that people don't have in those places and the, the life people need based on subsistence farming. They were able to feed themselves well, even though they were um, money poor, but uh, were not facing uh, shortages of food or anything. 
but they had virtually no cash income. Uh, and they used the edge of the forest for cultivating uh, what they needed and some extra to sell. Um, and also to um, use the, the wood in the forest uh, to build dugout canoes, which they would be using uh, for fishing and crab um, uh, collection. Uh, the protected area uh, then um, was in, de designated and people could no longer enter the forest without a permit, uh, could not cut the trees for their dugout canoes um, and had no place anymore to, to do the farming uh, without permits, which many of the people uh, couldn't afford to pay. And there were many zones where even without a permit uh, or with a permit, uh, people were not allowed to use, and those were the ones that were closest to the village. Um, so it was a system designed to really make it very difficult for the community to continue using the forest that you know they had done had their own regime to protect and had managed to protect for a long, long time against logging and other um, forces. And people say, yeah, if you can't pay the fine when you get caught, um, then they take you to the forest department and you go to jail. Um, they were not the source of, of, um, of destruction, um, yet they were left to have to try and grow manioc uh, on the beach. And you can imagine that uh, uh, nothing grows well in the sand uh, if there's nothing else. So with the biodiversity offset project, hunger came back to the community and many children were also taken out of school because families couldn't pay the school fees anymore. Uh, there were several so-called alternative livelihoods projects that were supposed to um, be implemented. The trouble was uh, they weren't uh, implemented by the community themselves, but uh, the company Rio Tinto or QMM, its, its subsidiary, um, would agree these projects or finance these projects through the NGO intermediaries. Um, communities have never seen a financial report of those and uh, said very clearly those projects, they don't work for us. And when uh, we raise uh, issues, they say, we hear you, we hear you, but there is no follow up. Um, when I was there first, which is now six years ago, we also heard about very, very deplorable tactics uh, used to ensure compliance um, with the restrictions on the land use. Uh, People said, you know, this and these NGOs that are supposed to implement the projects with us, they don't want to listen to us. Um, they come to tell us. Um, they don't come to ask what's the problem. Uh, we also found out that uh, in order to try and have, you know, uh, uninterrupted community meetings, the NGO would in the beginning often um, start the meetings with a church service uh, and they explained to us that that was, um, you know, to um, uh, to what, as they said, leverage the ecumenical culture to avoid disruption. This has stopped after it was exposed, but it shows the tactics that are being used um, to you know, make people comply with an offset project, even though, um, you know, the community wasn't really the driving force of, of, uh, of forest loss. The community also was never uh, given an explanation that what was presented to them as a conservation project was in reality a biodiversity offset for Rio Tinto um, and helped um, uh, end NGO opposition to the mine 50 kilometers away. Uh, the next example, uh, Uganda, uh, this is an example where, uh, so maybe to end the last one, um, one of the, the troubling uh, patterns that this example in Madagascar shows, in my view, is that with the biodiversity offset, the story of who is responsible for destruction and who's responsible for conservation was turned upside down. You know, in the a developing of the biodiversity offset, the destruction of 1,500 hectares of very species diverse forest by Rio Tinto for the profit of the corporation it became virtually invisible. The talk was about how um, well um, or how much Rio Tinto is doing to protect this forest that otherwise would have been destroyed allegedly by the community. So it was a total reversal of um, who's responsible for or driving deforestation and who's protecting it. 
uh, and that pattern I think we have seen with many forest carbon projects uh, as well. The next uh, example takes us to Uganda, uh, and it's uh, an example for the very high risk of biodiversity offsetting, enabling really perpetual destruction, uh, if, because it's an example where the offset needed offsetting. Um, and it's the Buyagali Dam, one of the most controversial and uh, high corruption dams uh, on the continent, financed by the IFC. The IFC uh, insisted that there would have to be an offset, a biodiversity offset for the destruction of the Buyagali Falls, which were very iconic, and they would be flooded uh, by the reservoir for the dam. Um, the, Buyagali Falls were also culturally and spiritually very important for uh, one of the peoples living in the area, the Baswaga. Um, and there was a legal uh, agreement between the IFC and the government of Uganda that the protection would be in perpetuity. But then a few years later, another dam just upstream was being built, the Isamba Dam, and the government gave the permission for that. The trouble was that the reservoir for Isamba was going to flood the Kalagala Falls, which were the offset for the Buyagali Falls that were being flooded. So the um, offset was being in need of offsetting. And uh, the legal agreement uh, turned out to have too much ambiguity and the World Bank turned out to be too willing um, to agree to the destruction of the offset on the condition that the offset be offset. This example, I think, shows very clearly and maybe more clearly than many others that there is no guarantee for a biodiversity offset to be maintained um, what the bank at the time insisted was in perpetuity. Perpetuity in that case did not last very long. And it's not the only example. Um, if we look to Guinea, uh, it's uh, we find the similar example. Boxit mine expansion, again, IFC financing, World Bank financing, and in order for the IFC to be able to fund the expansion, a biodiversity offset was needed because the expansion was going to destroy chimpanzee habitat. A national park was created. And ironically, another part of the World Bank was advising on the location of the Kukutamba Dam. And if it's built, the reservoir for the dam will flood part of the Moyan National Park that was created to be an offset for another um, World Bank funded uh, project, the Boxit Mine Expansion. Um, so here too, we see that um, the offset will have to be offset. And <laughs> it's, uh, you know, like perpetual, you know, if the offset needs an offset, needs an offset to be offset, there is nothing that prevents that because offsetting is based on the logic that there is nothing that is not replaceable. So there is nothing so unique that you cannot replace it with something somewhere, something um, that's made to appear similar somewhere else. And if we look to Australia, um, we have seen that there's documentation of the same happening there too. Coal mine offset was later destroyed by another company saying, but we want to expand coal here. So the coal, the first coal mining offset was offset by another offset. Uh, it's it's the perversity of it, and it underscores how really biodiversity offsetting as an approach um, enables or fast tracks biodiversity um, uh, destruction and in, uh, enables really the perpetual destruction. Because if you've bought into the logic once, you know there's nothing that that uh, gives you any argument against the destruction of the offset if it's offset by another offset. Um, another um, really big danger from a biodiversity perspective is the timescale mismatch that's also inherent in biodiversity offsetting. One of the examples um, to illustrate that is a, a dam project in Indonesia that if it goes ahead would isolate uh, a Tapanuli orangutan population into rather small and probably unviable populations. The Tapanuli is one of the most endangered uh, great apes. Uh, and uh, it's quite possible that, that this population would not survive the fragmentation. Uh, the company saying, well, don't worry about the, offset, the, the, the dam and the destruction of the uh, Tapanuli 
habitat because we'll do an offset. We will recreate a forest somewhere else. The trouble is that there is bound to be a time <clears throat> gap because the destruction will happen before it's um, assured that uh, the, the tree planting, if it goes ahead um, in the first place, will develop into enough of an intact forest for that new place to also uh, be a suitable Tapanui habitat. So the destruction will be done, but whether the offset will really um, achieve what the company says it will achieve uh, will only be seen later. So biodiversity offsetting uh, is bound uh, to push some uh, uh, species at risk over the brink of, of extinction because of the time mism uh, timing mismatch. So let's look at some lessons that uh, the carbon market uh, provides us that kind of underscore or um, strengthen uh, the the risks that we can already see from the first biodiversity offset projects uh, that, that have been documented and that exist. Um, first, um, with carbon offsetting as with, bi or with biodiversity offsetting as with carbon offsetting, uh, offsetting as an approach, uh, it, the dominant proposal, it, you know, it doesn't really address the drivers of biodiversity loss. It has the wrong starting point of the analysis. Um, Your time, by... just sorry to interrupt, it's 2.30 now, just to Thanks. let you know. Yeah, okay. Thanks. That, that works uh, a little less than five minutes and I'm through. Uh, and it also doesn't, beyond lip service, uh, offsetting also doesn't recognize the territorial rights of indigenous peoples and communities. Uh, and I think the complaints mechanisms that have been uh, implemented or, or set up will show uh, that at the end of the day, they will not really work to protect uh, community rights. Um, another lesson uh, that um, is becoming very apparent from the carbon offsetting experience and will is extending into the biodiversity offsetting experience is that it's the same northern uh, 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 or the same north south divide uh, that we see with carbon offsets that uh, the credit market beneficiaries are in the global north and the location of the land grabs is in the global south, even though there are also biodiversity offsetting projects in, in uh, uh, the more marginalized uh, areas in, in Europe. Uh, and we could, uh, in the discussion, go into that and some uh, impacts so society or social impacts that we see there already. Um, oh, bye, bye. Uh, another uh, impact, and here's uh, two more slides that give you more detail that maybe you can uh, ponder over um, uh, when you get the slides uh, showing the north-south divide and that uh, the, the auditors, uh, the uh, all of those part of the system of creating the biodiversity offset credit um, are largely located in the global north. Um, and uh, with biodiversity offsetting, perhaps more even than with carbon, we also see a lot of northern government uh, support for those initiatives and for the um, setting up of a, of a biodiversity market that doesn't exist yet at an international level. And here, you know, this one is also, I put it more in to give you an impression of just how many actors there are uh, already and how much Sophistication has gone into looking who will benefit from all of this. So this has been quite mapped out. And uh, the Bloom Labs Earth um, images are worth a look because they, um, you know, they tell you a lot about uh, the dynamics and the who is who in uh, this uh, developing uh, offset biodiversity offset market. We also see that a lot of the same actors that were active in the carbon offsetting um, are now developing biodiversity methodologies to put them together so they, from the same project area, will be looking to sell carbon credits and biodiversity credits at the same time. Here, uh, by Wildlife Works, uh, one of the examples, one of the large carbon offset project developers recently in the news for uh, uh, having not noticed sexual abuse in one of its projects for almost uh, 15 years, 
another example, Plan Vivo, one of the three big carbon standards, also announced that it is uh, developing a biodiversity standard. And just last week um, has or continues to be in the news in Sweden uh, because the newspaper Aftonbladet uh, documented how um, a Plan Vivo uh, certified project has been pushing families into hunger uh, in Uganda. And Plan Vivo says our auditors never heard of any of that, um, even though it was quite evident that people had no food to eat. Uh, another lesson um, from the carbon market is the for the biodiversity offset market, expect also an ever shifting narrative. You know, at the beginning, uh, it was every carbon credit represents um, one ton of carbon dioxide equivalent. Now jump over some of the changes, uh, but get to the last one. And now um, we hear them saying, oh, a ton isn't really a ton. And you really need to look <laughs> at the core benefits, um, at uh, the many good things uh, that carbon projects bring, even though sometimes the calculations around the carbon maybe aren't the most robust. Um, and we're working on better methodologies, so, so don't worry. Um, so almost acknowledging uh, that the past credits were junk, uh, but saying, don't worry too much, our projects were so good um, that even if you know the calculations weren't right, uh, we still did good. Um, and I'll jump over the example. We can come back to that one uh, in in the in the discussion. Uh, how far this goes um, is uh, and, and and how useless at the end of the day the standards are or compliance with the standards is is this letter from uh, Vera, one the largest carbon offset. Uh, standard. It found that one of its projects in uh, Colombia was in violation of, of its own rules. And then they granted a conditional exemption because if they had enforced compliance with their standard, the project wouldn't have been able to continue selling credits anymore. And you know the argument was, well, the project's doing some good. So if we stop it because it's violating our own rules, then the climate and community benefits uh, it, it won't be able to provide them anymore, even though it's in violation with the standard. The question is, what well, you have a standard if you grant exemptions um, so easily uh, in this case? Uh, and now coming to the end, we already see that also in relation to biodiversity, because offsetting has starting to become or has started to become a bad reputation. Um, we hear a lot uh, talk that uh, those biodiversity credits really they aren't for offsetting. Uh, there are so many other uses that um, they will help protect biodiversity, but don't call them offsets. You know, you're not fair if you if you call them offsets. I would say that's rubbish. Uh, excuse my language, um, because if they're not for offsets, um, who will pay for them? It's very obvious that buyer interest. And we're talking, you know, the, the, the narrative is uh, biodiversity credits will help leverage um, private sector finance. Well, then there has to be uh, buyers also um, for the credits. And where would they come from if not from the offsetting? Um, so expect uh, more shifting narratives there. And the question, I think, with this credit versus offsetting uh, um, pretends uh, is that, you know, if even if you call them by a different name, the approach, the calculations are still uh, those of uh, offsetting projects. And if the credits aren't meant for offsetting, then really why is so much effort being put into uh, generating those equivalences? And I think the big question is, um, if not for offsetting, then you know where will the money come from? And this is you know, ending here by saying, why all of this really contradictory approach? Why the risk to biodiversity? Why the risk to fast tracking uh, biodiversity destruction with offsetting uh, when we have ample experience from carbon offsetting at where this is going? And also starting to have similar um, documentation from the existing biodiversity offset project. So why all of this? And I think it's it's very clear, as long as our northern um, way of life isn't negotiable, um, the, the pressure will continue to be there for false solutions. And I think rather than um, 
the ideology of degrowth, we will have a civil society keep pushing um, against the or for the ideology of growth on a very limited planet uh, to be indeed up for negotiation um, if uh, by the halting biodiversity loss is where we want to get to. Um, and with that, I end um, with a very nice uh, cartoon. And I want to sort of um, alert you to uh, a nice series of cartoons, in fact, by Green Finance Observatory. Uh, Friederike has just done a really nice series there um, if you ever are in need of, uh, of some good uh, visual images for the absurdities around biodiversity offsetting. Um, his collection of cartoons uh, is a really good start, a uh, point to start. And of course, also you'll find a lot of information uh, both analysis and project documentation on the two uh, dossiers um, on the topic. And with that, I say thank you and um, let's move to the discussion. Thanks a lot, Jutta. That was a lot of uh, food for thought <laughs> and um, a very, I think, uh, yeah, approach to get behind the logic of the offsets. And thanks a lot for that. And um, yeah, I have a lot, a couple of questions I would like to raise, but I guess there is also a lot of questions coming from you. And uh, the good thing is we have still 20 minutes to discuss so we can ask you more questions and mm -hmm. and uh, get deep, deeper into um, into the topic. I, um, I just wanted, my first question would just uh, be, um, when did this really spark off? I remember studying this more than 10 years ago 2012 I remember that it was there was not that much research about it yet I don't know mm -hmm. but when what was the driver so it really kicked off and became that big and do you see like now the um, COP16 coming up uh, in in autumn what drivers yeah mm -hmm. what pushes will be, do you expect what we'll be pushing this approach even more and what are the forces that try to limit the approach like yeah Hmm. Yes, uh, the the revision of the IFC performance standards in 2012 was a really um, a kickstarted a lot of that. It was the reaction of the World Bank to a lot of safeguard policies that had kind of limited what the bank could still fund uh, uh, very easily when it came to habitat destruction. Um, so they were asked to finance a lot of projects where they would have to say, sorry, we can't finance that because it's against policy this and policy that and safeguard this and safeguard that. So a solution needed to do, be found to get around that. And that was the revision of uh, uh, performance standard six in particular, uh, which introduced biodiversity offsetting as a way to get around the policies. So all of a sudden, the World Bank could start, and the IFC in particular, could start financing projects in protected areas, in um, uh, in uh, um, heritage sites, as long as it could be shown that the damage would be offset. Uh, that uh, also went hand in hand with a lot of consultancy work that the World Bank did to countries. I remember a few years after uh, a World Bank report uh, on Liberia, where the suggestion was made uh, that uh, the um, underfinanced protected area system in Liberia could be funded with offset money from the mining industry. Uh, so the more mining, the better for uh, national parks. Um, and if you don't have mining, then you don't have money for the protection of national parks. So that was it, that was a very explicit uh, line of argument uh, in that report from the World Bank on how to finance uh, biodiversity conservation in Liberia. Um, they did similar um, a similar assessment for Mozambique. Uh, there was an initiative. Uh, much money spent but not much came out of it that involved Mozambique, Kenya and I can't remember the third country. Um, all of those initiatives or several of those initiatives meant to pilot um, biodiversity offsetting um, and also starting to put in place uh, regulation or push countries to, to put in place regulation to stimulate uh, national demand 
in the places where the mining was happening. So that's say in in Uganda, in Tanzania, in Mod in Madagascar, um, it would be a requirement to do an offset if there was mining. So to stimulate the demand for that. So the the revision of the the 2012 revision of the performance standard. Uh, the World Bank was definitely uh, one of those those key moments that that pushed um, a biodiversity offsetting. And from that, it was gradual work, I would say. It, it for me, this is the one moment where we can where we can say this is the moment. From then, the rest it was much more gradual, grinding, um, pushing, offering another pilot program here, financing another study there, um, working uh, and financing more metrics to be developed there, um, and to come to where we're at now, where uh, you know in in the um, Kunming uh, in the in the global uh, biodiversity framework, um, there is reference, um, and we have the big. Uh, UK France initiative um, trying to to push for um, for an international market. I'm still quite hopeful, I must say, um, that uh, there is lots of babble, much of money will be sunk into this. But the absurdity of uh, equivalences around biodiversity they are just so big. Um, that I think we need to get our act together as civil society and expose those absurdities. Um, you know, the, the, I remember there was one of the first studies in the UK by Louise Carver. Uh, she did a brilliant job. On, um, it was around the luxury housing development where she um, showed that at the end of the calculations, um, the offset for um, a very rare meadow was more football fields. So you could do enough uh, calculations. Uh, you make the football fields bigger, and then you know if the, the metrics allowed you to destroy any quality habitat, if you just um, set up enough uh, um, turf somewhere um, around the houses. So to, to really expose the absurdities um, and show that there is no equivalence, ecologically speaking, um, and there, I, I'm as I said, I'm, I'm. It's a lot more complicated and a lot more absurd to reduce uh, uh, the uniqueness of a space of a place to one metric, um, and I think people will see through that much more easily than with with carbon offsetting. And even with carbon offsetting, I think it's it's starting to sink in uh, that we're really uh, kidding ourselves if we think those equivalences are there. So. We need to to be creative and need to really expose that uh, there is no scientific basis basically for those equivalences. Uh, there are bricolage, there are, there are political decisions and uh, dressed up as as science, and I think that's where I'm quite hopeful. Uh, but why are you so you're hopeful? Maybe just coming back. Why are you hopeful that um, we can? <laughs> because for investors to really put money into this, uh, you know, there has to be a basis. That, that they are not too open to reputational damage. And we have seen uh, what the last year um, of exposure in the media has done to the carbon offset market. Uh, you know, I said next week or the week after, there's a webinar by the carbon industry complaining and lament, not complaining, lamenting about the guardianization of uh, of uh, exposure, you know, they came up with a new word just because there were six or seven or eight studies. Um, it was more than just a guardian, but it, it shows that, um, and this is just the tip of the iceberg um, that has shown, and then people started to look in closer and saw that really um, the metrics don't hold up, the certification scheme doesn't hold up. Um, that you know, this is fiction stories um, that are being financialized. And uh, with biodiversity offsetting, that will, I think it will be even easier to show uh, that the, the ecological basis for the equivalences is not there. Okay. But in, Thank you. in the meantime, there will be damage, there will be hardship, there will be families pushed into hunger um, and all of that. Um, you know, okay, um... we have two more questions here. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot, Jutta, for that. Uh, Giuliano? 
Yeah, thanks everyone. Juliana here from the United Nations Institute for Training and Research based in Brazil. Thanks very much for the presentation, Jutta. I have uh, two questions actually. Like how does the scale of biodiversity offsetting compare to carbon offsetting? We know that carbon offsets mm -hmm. have been around for a few decades mm -hmm. now already, but what's what's the scale like in terms of, I guess, money in the end or, or number of certifications? And secondly, okay, I mean, one part is to, obviously to criticize what is going on. And I think there are very compelling arguments why biodiversity offsetting is problematic. But then what, what would be the alternative policies to help mm -hmm. biodiversity loss? I mean, is the solution always to say, okay, we must not, you know, build this coal mine. We must not build this dam. But I mean, what would be the the, the, the alternative solutions then? Thanks very much. I think uh, for starting with the second, uh, when we talk so about Utah, maybe the... we take the we take Jody's question as uh, well because yeah. we have ten more minutes and then you yeah. can go into yeah. both uh, directly. Yeah. Um, Jody, please. Thanks, Joanna. Um... Yeah, it's actually a question, Jutta, that, that we began to broach in the in the first session, um, which is some time ago now, and, and we didn't get time to go into it in detail. Um, I have lots of questions, but I think the, the, the big one for me is, in the first session, you also spoke about this overarching narrative. Mm -hmm. um, and I think my experience in the NGO world is you have brilliant NGOs with real expertise who, who get really into the nitty gritty of issues and we can communicate on that well, but we seem to lack the power to challenge industry narratives at the sort of meta level. Mm -hmm. they, they seem to be so much better at it than, than we are. It's sort of shifting mm -hmm. the goalposts or shifting the target all the time. Yeah. And so we're behind and then we're catching up with language and then we're trying to debunk some new term, but they've already moved five terms ahead. Like the guardianization mm. is a good example that you've just, you know, mm. and it's such a dangerous term, uh, you know, but we're yes. always a little bit behind yes. in addressing it. Um, just wondering, yeah, do, do you have thoughts on how how we could do that better? Like, is is there, I don't, I don't even know, you know, is there a way that that's, we can improve that in in your in your mm. experience. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, the struggle is there for a reason, so it won't go there, uh, away tomorrow. We can always, you yeah, know. Uh, but I, I do think there are two aspects where we have room for improvement. One is supporting community struggles because a lot of those projects don't go ahead uh, where communities um, have the means to say our rights are violated and we will not let that happen. And I think as NGOs, we've often put that too late in the day and too low down on the priority list to really support uh, communities being well informed because you know we have a huge privilege, those of us in this room and the organizations we work with in terms of access to information, access to analysis. And we aren't always doing a good job in really translating that and making that available to the communities whose way of life um, is being changed uh, for the offsets that we, uh, you know, we might be involved in the safeguard discussion in the criteria discussion, but those communities who are affected by it generally are not, um, and aren't often aware of the context. So in thinking much more creatively than we have in how do we inform and transmit what's going on to communities that will be faced with those projects so that they are in a position to, to say, look, uh, we know what offsets are and we don't think they work for us. And we also don't think that you're right with your analysis. When you look at the carbon market, I think one of the big reasons, apart from the, the brilliant systems analysis and methodological analysis that happened last year, was also that the analysis of the methodologies came together with the documentation of the projects and from places where communities had a very clear understanding of why those projects were not in their favor and we're undermining them. And we're not only undermining their way of life, but also that of the community impacted by the oil destruction. 
Uh, I think you know those those two sides. We have we have a lot of space still to improve. The the other thing why I'm also quite hopeful still is that because the equivalences are so absurd, we have much more space than we have used in the legal system. You know, in in Germany, I've been following the the work that the Deutsche Umwelthilfe has done in um, taking companies to court for misleading advertising around carbon offsetting. And they're at, I think, more than 40 cases and not a single one lost. Or the other way around, all of the ones that have gone to court, uh, one or I think two are in, in appeal. But uh, the judges see very clearly uh, through uh, the rhetoric. So I may, and, and the EU has reacted um, to this constant exposure uh, by banning um, misleading advertising uh, of products or considering advertising of products as carbon neutral as misleading uh, if it's based on on uh, on offsets. So and in the, the question from Giuliano, can you answer yes, this as well? Yes, thank you. I, um, and then the the question: What is then uh, the, the the alternative uh, if not offsetting? I think there are many. And in places like World Heritage Sites and places that where communities or organizations and uh, civil society nationally has won the struggle for the protection, yes, the answer will have to be no to that destructive development in many places. Um, and in other places, it will have to be uh, where is destruction undone uh, before uh, new destruction can happen. I think we have to be uh, confronting the reality that we're living beyond our means uh, globally and that something has to give uh, if we don't want to really confront a very uncontrollable situation of multiple prices seen together. I mean, look at the south of Brazil right now, uh, Rio Grande do Sul, for how many disasters of that scale where tens of thousands of people are affected? Can we sustain as societies? And it's not going to get better if we think we can go ahead with the next dam, with the next mining project. We have some very, as societies, some very big questions to, to discuss. And biodiversity offsetting doesn't help us have that discussion. So the alternative is to say, yes, we might say at times the mine is necessary, the road is necessary, the dam is necessary, but we must keep. And the we is there those who make those decisions and benefit from the development. We must keep the, res the, the responsibility that comes with that destruction and not say I have no responsibility because I have offset. No, we have to live with that uh, that responsibility and have discussion if we want to give money somewhere else yeah let's finance it but not through the pretension that there is an equivalence between the destruction and whatever is is financed as restoration restoration can happen without offset let's not pretend that there is an equivalence there i think that's that's the big issue um around the alternatives yes some construct some destruction will continue to happen but there needs to be a different honesty that it's not replaceable. You know, we need to to respect some basics of 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 life and biology. That uh, the uniqueness of place is not re replaceable, um, and that's what biodiversity offsetting pretends. And we have really no time for for continuing that kind of pretense on the scale. It's difficult to say because it also depends on what you uh, count as biodiversity offsetting. Nationally, biodiversity offsetting schemes have been happening for quite some time, um, but they have moved to more um, further away from the location of destruction over time. And I have no time to go into that, but I can share afterwards with you some, some publications where we, I've looked into that and documented. Regulated destruction from Friends of the Earth International is one uh, publication about three years ago where some of the uh, national initiatives and how they have changed um, are, are being... Um, described. So it's difficult to say. I would say if you only look at the international biodiversity offsetting and crediting um, initiatives, much, much smaller than carbon. But if you include the national initiatives, where it's sometimes difficult to know where exactly the offsetting part begins, um, 
there's been quite some money. India is an interesting one. Uh, that's the last comment I make on this, uh, to see where it's also going and where another trap of biodiversity offsetting is. India for many, many years has had a compensatory um, afforestation fund. So a company destroying uh, forest would have to pay into a fund to finance restoration or reforestation somewhere else. There are billions um, in the fund. Um, and it's even billions of dollars, not uh, the, the national currency, um, because the money was paid in, but there was no land found to do the restoration. Um, so the destruction went ahead, but the restoration didn't. Um, and there was no mechanism for to, to stop that, because the law said you can get the permit to destroy as long as you pay into the fund. Um, so if you and if you include those kind of figures uh, into into the calculation, then a lot of money has gone into biodiversity offsetting already, or into funds that pretend uh, or are, are designated to biodiversity offsetting. I think the question. In reality, the biodiversity offsetting activities, you will find a big scarcity. Even with a lot of the IFC projects, it's very difficult to find whether the offset that was promised was ever ever uh, even initiated. I leave it there. Okay, that's really clear words, Jutta. Thanks a lot for that. And um, it's uh, three o'clock now. It's, if there's not no urgent, I think it's always good to keep the time because I guess people have other commitments as well. And um, um, yeah, we. Um, if there is no urgent questions now, I would like to close it and um, yeah, hope you could all take um, something away for your work with this and get some new ideas. And thanks a lot, Jutta, for this. And we keep on the discussion and um, we will keep on. Um, yeah, working on these issues and to see how we can integrate them more into our work. Great, thank you. Um, thank you. I hope I covered uh, 